So anyway, I was um, really excited about this because I remember when I first started studying wine, I had no idea what phylloxera was, no clue. This is a totally new concept to me. And I remember the first class that we were taking and someone, and we talked about it. I was like, what is this? And it shocked me because it was so, it had such a huge impact on the world of wine all over, I mean, everywhere. And it was such a significant event but I feel like most people just don't know a lot about it. So I thought it would be really fun to kind of explore it a little bit. And for those of you who do know about it, maybe you'll learn some more. And for those of you who've never heard of it, this will be really, really fun. Um, so first of all, obviously the most important part of any of these, what are we drinking? <laughs> Here's my um, beautiful Carignan, which I'm very excited about. Um, this is, ooh, it's from Chile. And so, that has some importance as we'll talk about it when we start getting into phylloxera and the whole thing in general, but this lovely little red guy, 100% Carignan from Vines in Chile, very tasty and delicious. And Chile is a country that actually does not have any phylloxera and you'll see what that means if you don't know already. Um, but anyway, so cheers, thank you all for coming and have, let's get started. Yay, this is really like the best part of my week. I don't know about you guys, but. I'm pretty happy with it. <laughs> All right, uh, give me one sec. I'm going to get this going. And All right. Hi, guys. So this is, this is really fun, I think. Um, this is essentially, as you can see, I hope everyone's enjoying this. I, I, I refrained from getting pictures of the actual bug itself. <laughs> I thought maybe it would be better to just go ahead and, and stick with illustrations just because, you know, when you get into these fun little... Uh, <laughs> Um, areas. Oh, yay, Sarah. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Stephanie. I like that. Okay. Anyway, so phylloxera. This is a beautiful, lovely little uh, illustration of the insect itself. Um, much, much prettier than I think if you actually saw the insect. But so for anyone who didn't know, spoiler alert, phylloxera is a bug. <laughs> and as we get started with it, so phylloxera Here's another iteration of this little thing, but technically this very, very microscopic little bug is a louse and it's in the family of aphids. So anyone who gardens, you're gonna obviously be familiar with the idea of the aphid and also have a good representation of how small that little thing is, that little critter. Um, so like aphids, this is a plant bug. Um, it actually lives both underground and above ground. So the phylloxera louse itself, will <laughs> the phylloxera one itself will also have um it feeds on the roots and then it can get above ground and it can also attack the leaves and the vines themselves as well but the majority of the damage it does is usually in the roots so this tiny 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 little bug is pretty complex it goes through a lot of different life cycles um the picture here shows that it starts off really the majority of its life, um, obviously as an egg, and then it becomes, as it you know gets out of its egg, it becomes a crawler. I know this is, sorry guys, but it's fun. <laughs> so it becomes a crawler and it basically crawls from you know root to root underneath the vines, and then it will go from vine to vine underneath the ground. So it'll travel below ground and also above ground, and then dig back down to go ahead and get into those roots. Um, in some regions, specifically tend to be uh, more humid regions, uh, for whatever reason, I, I wasn't able to figure that out, but um, in various regions and in various iterations, the phylloxera insect will actually also grow wings. So that means that it can then become airborne, fly between vineyards and vines and stuff, which can increase the, um, the spread of it. So ultimately what ends up happening there is you have uh, a bug, a very tiny, tiny little microscopic insect that's hard to see, that suddenly becomes very, very transportable, very mobile, um, both underground and above ground. It actually, uh, so we'll learn why this is a big problem, of course, as, as, the, as the show goes on. <laughs> so what does phylloxera technically do? Um, as I mentioned, it does feed on the roots of the vines themselves. So the roots are the heart system of a vine. The roots are where all the nutrients in the soil, all of the water, everything that it needs to get those um, vitamins, minerals to the grapes through the, the vine itself in order to photosynthesize into sugars to then create the grapes that we make into wine. Um, very, very, very important. The root system, again, part of the plant. So when these little critters are feeding, 
basically what they're doing is they're creating wounds in the roots themselves. And a couple of things happen at this point. As they're feeding, they do inject their own poison, essentially, into the roots itself, which turn into bumps and essentially cause um, a problems within the root system to function correctly. So it can no longer have that uptake of mineral, that uptake of water that the plant needs. And this happens over a period of time. What also happens is those wounds that are created through the feeding process then just stay open. And so other microbes that already exist in the soil or bacteria can infect the plant through those wounds and eventually uh, kill the plant um, and, and the, you know, the whole vine dies. Um, also, when they are above ground, these little insects will also lay their eggs in the leaves. So then you get these bumpy little egg sacs that are on the leaves. This can inhibit photosynthesis and the absorption of the sun and minerals as needed, again, for creating the sugars to make the grapes. And of course, the vine dies. So in all these situations, the vine dies. It's very sad. But uh, it takes a while for the vine to die. So when this little critter finally finds a vineyard and makes a home there, it's several years before the effects of the feeding process and the multiplication process actually start to be uh, seen by anyone. And so when you start to see the problem, it's too late, you can't do anything about it. So it's, a, it's, it's very, very discouraging. And especially when you don't know what's happening, which is what basically was the, the majority of the existence of phylloxera when this whole thing began. So, the thing about this little bug too, being so small, it's also really easily transportable um, through the soil, through also um, water, irrigation it can move through, and you end up also with this problem of needing to um, be very, very careful because as you're walking through a vineyard, if there's phylloxera in that vineyard, you can carry it from one place to another in the soil on your boots. It's a pretty big bummer and you have no idea you're doing it. And that's essentially how this whole situation got started, which we'll learn through. Um, and also, it's the idea of when it's above ground, so for example, if you, it's in the form where it is feeding on the leaves, or it's laying eggs on the leaves, or it's in its winged version, wind or machinery can easily go through. You think about harvesting tractors, right? Those things create all sorts of havoc in the vineyard, and leaves are flying everywhere, and grapes are falling, and so there's a lot of motion and commotion that spreads these little bugs all over the place and moves them from one place to another. Yeah, I know, it, it felt kind of appropriate uh, talking about this little bug. It's, it's the invisible, the silent killer, um, like our COVID, uh, which is really tricky. Uh, I had that thought too. <laughs> so ultimately, yeah, silent, silent, but not so, not so friendly. Um, although I think, I think my little uh, rendition of it is pretty cute in that picture. After that, um, you, you probably want to know, like, where did this thing even start? This crazy little bug, where did it come from? How could this possibly be? It's not from China. It, it, from, not. it is It is from, unfortunately, the United States. So, ta-da! Um, this little bug is native to specifically the east coast of the United States, which is very interesting. Um, you probably haven't heard about it affecting any uh, wine in the United States or Native American vines because Native American vines, vines that originated on this continent, grew up with phylloxera and evolved with a natural resistance to the bug itself. Um, so to backtrack just a little bit, the way that it works is that in your, in the vine world, if you will, um, the, the vines that we use for wine, for example, um, everything Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, all those grapes are part of the vinifera species of the vitis plant. So vitis vinifera, that is the European vine. That vine essentially was evolved and grew up and is native to Europe. But all of the best, all, like majority, like 99% of the wines that we drink are made from vitis vinifera grapes. Now, in America, we have other species. We have multiple species of grapes. Uh, a lot of them are used for making table grapes. Some of them are used to make wine and historically have been, but historically, these wines are not generally, um, shall we say, considered good. <laughs> um, for the most part, uh, wines made from American grapes tend to be what they call proxy, which is a really, it sounds like kind of a fun, sexy word to describe the wines, but in reality, it's not. Um, it generally means that they kind of have a uh, musty, musty kind of yucky, barnyardy kind of uh, aroma and flavor profile. There aren't a lot out there, but there are 
more actually being made. Uh, since you know everywhere in the United States does make wine, there's a lot more experimentation these days trying to make better quality wines from American grapes or American uh, and then Vitis vinifera hybrids as well. So merging those two together and trying to make wine out of those grapes. There's some successful, some not, but the point is the majority of wines that we love and know and drink continuously are from the Vitis vinifera grape. So when those vines were originally brought over to the United States, they died and people just couldn't figure out why. There were obviously, because we were colonized well, well, you know, 1492, all the way back to, you know, the age of exploration, obviously wine did not come over with the Europeans. They tried to bring wine over, but their vines suddenly just wouldn't flourish in the new, the new region. And they, they used to think it was just because of other things. They thought it was other diseases. They blamed Pierce disease or other um, natural drought conditions or weather, things like that, because nobody knew about the little bug and the American grapes didn't have a problem with it because they were resistant. So this just beca became sort of a tricky situation because nobody knew that this little bug was around. So this changes when we hit the mid 1800s. And this is what I'm calling the European invasion. So essentially, we get to the mid 1800s, there's a few things kind of going on, right? We have um, some more, the, the advent of steamships, right? Are making transportation across the Atlantic faster and more efficient. So there's a lot more trade that's happening between the United States and Europe and other European countries. This includes, of course, a lot of horticultural and viticultural trading and just exploration. So um, part of it was just wealthy uh, people in England, for example, who wanted greenhouses that had fancy foreign plants in it. So there was actually a lot of plants that were brought over specifically for um, growing in greenhouses and selling to consumers. Of course, with that came vines as well, because this whole exploration and cross back and forth of trying to create wine in America led both European winemakers in, to get interest in um, American grapes. And then also, of course, American winemakers trying to make wine in the United States from grapes that they didn't think tasted bad. So one particular person uh, during this time in 18, 1861, so there's actually a man called Augustin um, heresy and he is the he began Sonoma's oldest winery which is called Buena Vista winery and this winery was began in 1857 and in 1861 he made a grand trip to Europe because he was out for finding the best vines and wanting to bring them back and make great wine in the United States and so he went to France he went to Germany he went to uh, Switzerland he went everywhere to collect samples and he tromped through all their vineyards and he walked through all the beautiful rows of vines, and he brought back about 350 different types of grapes. He also, when he traveled over there, brought his own vines with him. Um, so it would be, it's a very romantic story to blame him for bringing <laughs> Phylloxera to Europe, but in, in the reality of it, there was a lot of transportation happening between um, so so much uh, so much trade between 1858 and 1862 that there's no way to pinpoint exactly when the phylloxera bug actually arrived in Europe. But suffice to say, somewhere during that mass transportation time, it hitched a ride and it did pretty well. And because the travel what didn't take as long as it used to, it no longer had it didn't die. It lived, it flourished, and it landed. So. This wasn't really discovered. Uh, phylloxera wasn't really discovered in Europe until 1863, and it was actually in England. So it was an entomologist at Oxford University who was brought based, who was brought vine clippings from a greenhouse that was selling them. And he had leaves that had these weird little bumps on them, these galls, they call them, that were the egg sacs. Um, so most likely this was actually an American plant, but he started investigating it. He started researching what this could possibly be. And this was again in 1863. So, but fast forward about five years, four to five years, in 1867 is when you have the first written account of the phylloxera issue, even though they didn't know it was phylloxera yet, they had no idea what was causing that. But in 1867, there started to be widespread reports of failing vineyards in France. And so these vineyards were just dying and they couldn't figure out why. And it was all over, it was in the Rhone, it was in the south of France. And so there began this big process to try and figure out what was happening to these plants. Um, because until this point, first of all, nothing was wrong. And then when finally something was wrong, there was nothing they could do about it. And as we know, as soon as 1867 came around and they saw their vineyards dying, it was already too late because those bugs had been there for years. So 
what happened? It was devastation on a widespread scale. And of course, now the Irish potato famine killed many, many, many people. So in that respect, it is not nearly on the equivalent. But in the socioeconomic impact that uh, that sort of situation had, uh, they compared the two because they were both blights that were caused by plant bugs, plant um, plants, like uh, things that attack plants, right? The potato famine was caused by a bug, and this particular issue of phylloxera was a bug that initiated this entire widespread devastation of the wine industry and vines across Europe. So as you can see, I mean, it's pretty, pretty crazy. 6.2 million acres of vineyards, it's, that's a lot of wine. That is a lot of vineyards, and that is a lot of lively livelihood, and um, you know, it's just, it's, it's sad. It's hard to imagine too, because I mean, 6.2 million acres just sounds like a lot, but then there's other ways to look at it, which is that was basically 40% of the, all the vineyards in France, right? So we're just talking France here too. We're not even talking about the time because it spread. It started in France and France saw it first, but it spread everywhere. It spread to Spain and Italy and Greece, all around Europe and South Africa, uh, New Zealand as well. It made its rounds because again, it had an incubation period of three to four years before anyone knew what was going on. So that's how much time it had to travel and get spread throughout the world. And like this time period as well, between 1875 and 1889, so we're looking at about 14 years after this had already hit Europe, it was about 75% of production was lost out of France. So that's huge. That was over, um, it was like 18, 1800 million gallons of wine were not produced in that period of time that should have been, which is insane. And then, so from 1860 to basically the end of the century, phylloxera was popping up everywhere in all sorts of different countries. And it was pretty crazy. Um, it actually came back to California <laughs> in 1873 um, because vines were again brought back uh, to, European vines were being brought back to California again for this, this hope to try and create new, new wines, and they were hit by phylloxera, of course, um, but all throughout there. Uh, and and it, it became a problem because still in seven, 19, or 1873, nobody knew what was causing this widespread devastation. Um, they had finally figured out that there was some sort of bug, but no one could figure out how to stop it. So in 1873, the French government actually issued a reward to anyone who could solve or cure the problem. And this reward was 300,000 francs. And in, in, in 1873, that was a lot of money. Um, and to put it in perspective, the equivalent in today's dollars is about $3.2 million, so U.S. dollars. So if you were, you know, looking for some funding, um, coming up with that solution would have been a really, really great way to do that. Um, and so they put out this, they put out this reward, and then the funny thing was, of course, they got tons of responses back. Um, over the course of about three years, three years, they had 696 suggestions and some of them were a bit silly so a couple that I found that were really funny um, there was one suggested cure from someone that said uh, to bury living toads under the vines that would then draw the poison out to kill the aphids which is funny um, another recommendation was to irrigate the vines with white wine and that would somehow cure the issue um, Neither of those worked. I don't know if they were actually tried, but there were over a thousand attempts at practicing different cures that were suggested over the course of three years, and they just couldn't figure out how to fix it. They couldn't find a cure. But eventually they did. And what is that cure? So um, over many years, obviously, people were very, very, very bent on trying to figure out how to fix this problem. Um, some of the things that initially seemed to work, um, one of the cures that came out was flooding. And flooding, basically, they found that if they were able to flood vineyards over the course of a winter for several weeks, they would essentially drown out the, the phylloxera bugs. Um, this obviously, while it did solve the solution in some areas, was not a universal solution because water is not a universal um, resource in most wine regions. In fact, in many wine regions, that amount of water is not, is not realistic for just a growing period in general. Sometimes you don't have enough for that or even for irrigation. Um, though that was a, a successful attempt in some places, and it is sometimes still used in Argentina where they do have the opportunity and available sort of 
offflow from the mountains from the Andes to create flood circumstances that can do that kind of damage to the phylloxera bug itself. For the most part, that wasn't a universal solution and it wasn't viable to, to use. Um, another thing was, of course, different pesticides, but for the most part, they found that these pesticides were ineffective against phylloxera, even though they would kill other bugs and natural, um, natural ones as well, natural and unnatural, but none of them seemed to work. So it was originally suggested in 1869 of the idea of grafting European roots onto American rootstock. So this, you guys, is the magic of this whole day. This is what we, this is sort of the magic moment of the phylloxera epidemic and its solution. Um, to start, I'm just going to go over really quickly what grafting is. For anyone who might be curious, I'm sure you all know, but just for fun, I'll talk and listen to myself talk. <laughs> but um, like these pictures show here, grafting is the idea of basically merging two different vines together. Uh, and this has happened throughout history for vines uh, for many, many different reasons. One of the most common reasons, for example, if you have a vineyard and it's, let's say it's all um, Merlot and then the movie Sideways comes out and you realize, oh no, I can't sell any Merlot. I have all these vineyards that I won't be able to make money off of. I want to change what I'm planting. Um, you could plant a new vineyard, but of course that would take four to five years before you can actually um, get any grapes to produce wine out of there, so it's not a very economical situation. Or you can head graft the, you can head graft kind of the turducken of wine. Um, you can head graft one, a different varietal, for example, let's say you want to move from Malbec to Chardonnay, or sorry, Merlot to Chardonnay, since now everyone wants to drink Chardonnay. Uh, you just basically cut off those Merlot vines closer to the roots. You stick, uh, you can kind of see in the picture there, you cut into the base root and tie on, basically insert the new grape vine, the Chardonnay grape into the bottom half of the Merlot grape vine and you tie them together and you let them grow together and merge. And now your vineyard is going to be producing Chardonnay grapes. So it's an amazing process, um, obviously, again, used for a wide variety of reasons for a long period of time, but had not previously been needed for something like this. And so the rootstock, again, specifically, rootstock are the roots of the vine. So it's the part that's underground. And as we mentioned, these rootstocks have different properties. These are uh, based the, uh, the, the lifeline to the vine to uptake minerals and water. So they're really, really important, but they are technically American. So this suggestion was originally made in 1869. Um, there was actually a man from Bordeaux named Leo Lalleman who had been experimenting with American rootstock in this way as early as 1840 because he was trying to deal with other vineyard pests and he had come up with this idea of maybe using uh, for, or mildew like trying to find a way to create mildew resistant grapes without changing your grape or having to cross it with a different species um, or grapevine um, and he in earnest started using this towards the end of the 1860s but by then it had actually really been proposed officially um, in 1868 and 69 by the Heroic Commission. And this was a group of scientists who were basically put together at Montpellier University in Southern France to deal with the issue of the phylloxera bug. And they found out that it was in fact the phylloxera bug that was verified by a scientist in the United States, an entomologist in Missouri who identified that the one bug that was in France was the same bug that was in America. And that connection then created a huge, huge boon to the industry to figure out that that would be a solution by being able to take those European vines, match them to American rootstock that were already resistant, and then voila, you have a European vine that is now resistant to phylloxera. Makes perfect sense. It wasn't widely accepted. It was very, it took a while um, in specific regions in particular like uh, Burgundy. They outlawed the use of American rootstock all the way up until 1887, which was well after as you can see, um, between you know 1880 and 1885, when the solution was first presented, everybody everybody started planting on American rootstock. So it was a pretty universally accepted um, idea and concept, but not necessarily um, done by everyone because there were some misgivings. So for the most part, the world, the wine world, was grateful for a solution. A few individuals were holdouts. Uh, they were concerned, for example, especially in Burgundy, where they have, they're known for their high quality wines. 
<laughs> exactly. So the, um, the, the amount of, they were concerned that these American rootstocks would taint their wine quality. Um, as it turns out, that is, it makes sense. Honestly, when you first start to think about it, you're like, well, I don't know, these roots might just ruin what my wine tastes like and my wine's really expensive. But essentially you have, um, that has been proven false. So the rootstock that you choose does not change the flavor profile of the wine any more than any other element of wine growing does. So last week we talked about terroir and there's all these various elements that come together to make the perfect situation for your, for your vineyard and to produce the wine that you wanna make. And your rootstock is just one part of that. But have, having that rootstock be specifically American versus European does not create significant changes with the grape and the outcome of the wine itself. So that was proven pointless and then everyone got on board. And at this point in 1990, 85% of all grapes were planted on American rootstock. So problem solved, right? No such thing, phylloxera is here, it, or it's gone now, and we don't have to worry about it anymore, right? Not true. So phylloxera is very much still here and it's always a threat. The good news is, is that most American rootstocks are still proving to be resistant. So if you are planted on American rootstock, you should be safe. Now, um, that is, there have been some exceptions to that, but um, in the 1990s, for example, there was a particular rootstock that was generated. It was developed, if you can say, um, for the market and for the wine producer and wine grower market. It was called AXR1, and it was uh, sold as kind of a cure-all to winemakers across the United States. Uh, basically, they were saying, we can increase your yield so you can get more grapes without reducing the quality. And as we all know, we've talked about this, you need your grapes to struggle in order to produce high quality grapes. So it's always quantity versus quality. And this AXR1 rootstock, they were claiming that you could have both quantity and quality. Uh, it also required a whole lot of irrigation. I think they sold some irrigation lines with it. I'm not sure. But the point was that a lot of California, the majority of uh, wineries in California actually did move to this rootstock. And this rootstock ended up becoming susceptible to a mutation of phylloxera. So it was like a phase two phylloxera bug that just attacked this one root. Uh, this one rootstock. So that happened in the 1990s and that just devastated California. Um, Two thirds of all the, the vines in Napa were ripped up. That's a lot of money. <laughs> Even in the 1990s, I mean, we're talking like, that was bad. It also hit Oregon. So this was right after the Oregon wine uh, region had just sort of been coming into its own and making a name for itself. And they had hoped that they were, they were still planting on European rootstock. So they were hopeful that this virgin soil that they had would be safe. It was not, alas, so they lost a lot of vines as well. But you still have some countries and some regions throughout the world that have never seen phylloxera. So as I mentioned, Chile, cheers, is one of those countries. Um, some people claim it's because on several sides Chile, of the wine growing region in Chile are deserts. And sand is one of the soils that has proven to be uh, not habitable for phylloxera bugs. Um, there's a claim that it's because the, the insect itself can't travel underground from um, plant to plant, from root system to root system because of the texture of the sand. There's also the idea that sand is essentially silica and at a microscopic level, silica, you can imagine, is just like shards of glass. So you're basically cutting yourself and it just, it can't survive, it can't live in that kind of an environment. So sandy soils have proven to be phylloxera free um, potential zones. And a lot of the, uh, the, the roots that are still on their own, um, the vines that are still on their own root system, you'll see in sandy soils. Uh, that's also a term you'll hear, own rooted sometimes, when people are describing wines. And that essentially means that these are ungrafted vines. Uh, Pia Franco is actually another term, it's, a, it's very fun to say, which means free footed, right? Pia Franco, foot free. Um, so it means that it's on its own rootstock. And there are some very, very famous vineyards. Uh, Bollinger, the champagne producer, actually has its own, um, its own vineyard in Champagne that is completely phylloxera free. And they make a very, very, very expensive champagne from it. So I would highly encourage anyone to go out and get that who can afford it <laughs> and then tell me all about it. Um, but there's also particular regions, for example, in, um, in various countries that have sort of pockets but there are, and, and sometimes it's the soil, and sometimes people aren't quite sure why phylloxera has not particularly invaded a significant area. Um, the Nacido Vineyard, actually, which is just up in Santa Barbara, for all you Californiaites, 
um, you have you have phylloxera free vines that are still there and they're self-rooted as well, very, very old. Um, but there's also regions, for example, in Australia, you have, uh, Australia has been hit by phylloxera, but for example, specifically Western Australia and then South Australia and Tasmania are phylloxera free zones. And that is only because Australia has implemented very, very serious, we'll all relate to this, quarantining measures for those particular regions. So essentially, if you're traveling in Australia and you're going from Victoria, for example, to South Australia, your, your car is stopped, your premises are searched. They are very, very thorough about making sure that no bugs will be transported across those lines. And it's very, it's just very, um, very, very serious down there, but by doing so, they've been able to keep those particular areas free from phylloxera. Um, and so when we're talking about that too, though, I, I do want to mention that there are, for example, in Chile, these, just because Chile doesn't have phylloxera does not mean that all of its vines are planted on Vitis vinifera rootstock. There's a multitude of reasons why winemakers would still choose to use American rootstock for their vines. And that's because these rootstocks, these variety of rootstocks that we have, have different properties, like I mentioned. Um, a lot of American rootstocks they found were intolerable to the European soils that had high, a higher cal calcium content to it. So there was, a, there was basically a chlorosis that was happening that was killing the vines because it was taking up too much. Um, the calcium that was in the soils was, was killing the vine itself. So they had to find the specific type of American rootstock that was more resistant and more applicable for that particular soil environment. So that makes a difference and some people may choose to use rootstock even if they don't have phylloxera because their soil content needs that kind of protection. Or some of these rootstocks are resistant to other bugs like nematodes and that can be a big problem specifically in Chile. So a lot of those vines are on rootstocks that are nematode resistant to help prevent other vineyard diseases. So there's a variety of reasons again why you would go ahead and not choose to keep your natural European rootstock even though you were phylloxera free. <laughs> Almost like driving into California. <laughs> Absolutely. It's quarantine, man. Quarantine, baby. We are all over the place. All right, you guys. So that is, that's it for today. That is our lovely little shindig on phylloxera. I really hope that you guys had, uh, I hope this is fun and educational. I think that this is, uh, you know, it's an interesting topic to me. So I'm so glad that all of you were able to join and enjoy it. Um, I, please feel free. You're welcome to um, to, to share. If you, we know it's interesting too, because I feel like, yes, of course, um, Jonathan is asking if there's still experts who claim wines from old roots were better. Uh, and this is really a matter of, there is, it's a question, right? My argument whenever I think about that, because my first thought was, of course, anything that's on its own roots is going to be a better quality wine. So on um, from that comment, that, that initial thought is this. First of all, if two wines, if you're, if you're blind tasting two wines next to each other, you're not going to be able to say, oh, this, this wine was grown on its own rootstock and this one was clearly grafted onto American rootstock. Oh. You know, it's, there's really, that's just a, a ridiculous concept to even try and put into place for blind tasting. That being said, when we go back to the idea of rootstocks, you, the idea is great that if it's on its own roots, it's got to be more natural. It's got to be more um, pure and more concentrated. Uh, but if you if you have the root planted in the wrong soil, or if your natural environment isn't fully compatible with producing the highest quality wine possible, then it's not going to matter what rootstock you have, right? So that's one thing to take into effect. Um, there's also the idea that, you know, um, I totally lost what I was going to say. I had another comment that's going to come back. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> but yeah, so you can claim that, oh, that was what I was going to say. The reason, too, why people would say that is because a lot of vines that are on their own roots are very, very old. So as we've learned, the older your roots get, the older your vine gets, the more concentrated and more complex the grapes are that it produces, which will inherently produce a better or more complex wine too, right? So there's that idea that can lend towards the idea of, you know, old own rootstock wines being a better quality. Did yields vary for when they, they grafted onto American rootstock? There wasn't, so again, this is what you have to take into consideration. Yields will always vary based on a variety of reasons. And so it's up to you as the winemaker, whoever is planting the vineyard to be able to 
mitigate all the terroir and all the elementary elemental factors that go into producing the wine, like making sure there's enough um, water, sun, heat, all of those things. And rootstock is a part, think of rootstock as being a part of terroir, right? We went through the whole list last week and rootstock is kind of a component, but rootstock itself can, some rootstocks actually uh, create more vigorous vines. So they're considered, some people will choose specific American rootstocks um, for their ability to increase yields, honestly, or decrease yields if they have vines that don't have, um, yeah. The idea, um, so does that make sense, I think? And grafting, yes, grafting goes on all the time today. Uh, that, that statistic that I had was from 1990 that said 85% of uh, vineyards are on American rootstock or worldwide, and that is just increased. I mean, most people will plant vineyards automatically on American rootstock because they know that it's phylloxera resistant, so. So yeah. Anyone else? We got a thing, we got a thing. Just ready to drink? All right, well, thank you guys again. I am so thrilled that you're all able to make it. Um, have a wonderful, wonderful week. Next week is Pinot Noir. Should be a no-brainer, right? I imagine a lot of people will be excited about it. 